All of this now, a month ago, Home Affairs Minister Arun Mutsualedi announced that the department has begun the process of digitizing around 350 million documents, some dating back as far back as the 1800s. The minister then further announced that the process would include the employment of 10,000 unemployed graduates for the project through the presidential employment stimulus. Joining us now for an update on the processes in the uh, Department of Home Affairs is Deputy Minister uh, of the Department, Njabulo Nzuz. That will also be joined by Prof. Keith uh, Breckenridge, Deputy Director of the Virts Institute for Social and Economic Research and author of several works on global politics of identification and surveillance in South Africa and former colonies, amongst others. By the way, you can be in touch with us uh, and uh, you want to engage with the Deputy Minister on the current system and what are some of the challenges that you want to highlight and what you suggest should be done. 072-110-5584. That's the WhatsApp number. Otherwise, you can tweet us at Newsroom 405. Prof. Keith, Deputy Minister, good evening, and thank you very much for your time and for joining us uh, tonight uh, here on In Focus. Le le let's start here, right? You, you want a future fit model of the Department uh, of Home Affairs. You tell me what does that look like for you. First, let's start with the, the, this context of managing the official identity and the status uh, of South Africans. Because here's the challenge that many are having currently with the system. They're really deeply frustrated with the fact that, one, the officials themselves are not as professionally capable to deal with some of the complexities that they've got to deal with because you, are, uh, you adopted almost a, a legacy system that had that kind of infrastructure and, 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 that, and that kind of, of staff complement. Two, uh, you, you have few records which are available, which I'm sure you'll tell us. That's why you're digitizing uh, and, and you're Im improving accessibility. But the other issues are, are around the, the actual system itself. The network is unreliable. The back office is unresponsive. What has been particularly frustrating for you in this effort of building a, a modern and a, a secure uh, system? Look, we've come uh, quite a long way. Uh, you will remember when it comes to technology, it rapidly, you know, improves with time. And if you are not able to catch up with it, you then have opportunity costs because you lose out on the benefit that it comes with. We had the modernization program that we started in 2012. That modernization program is what led us to live capture. It's what gave birth to uh, systems like your e-visa, what we have now, which is the branch appointment uh, booking system. All of those came out of the modernization project. But now we are saying we must move to the digital era where most of the records must be kept digitally and that is why we are having this digitization project. We understand very well that we have been having quite substantial problems with our network architecture which has resulted into queues being long in our offices and as such that is why we are putting up this investment in technology and it is not just in a short term or long term only but it is a phased in approach. Yeah. For instance if you look at our branch uh, booking appointment system it's meant to deal with queues so that when you go to the office you are guaranteed that you will be assisted on the spot within the date in which you come in the time in which you come but that does not mean we'll stop people from physically coming into our offices the introduction of mobile units has also been one of the systems that we have brought in to make sure that we reduce the queues we previously had about 100 mobile units we use them we could see that they are able to reach out particularly to learners who are in school were able to go and service them there. We've added 10, we are now adding another 20. So all those channels are meant at easing the congestion in our offices. But in the long run, what we ought to be doing is to looking at a future fit home affairs where everything is done digitally. That is why we have the project which we call the automated biometric information system yeah. which improves on how we capture biometrics which will now include facial recognition, iris and other uh, ways of identifying people which will make our work quite easy in the front end. So those are long term kind of plans but we understand that we have to intervene in the immediate through our contracts with CETA to make sure that we improve our systems uh, uptime and our availability yes. of networks. Prof. Keith, are, are we starting at the right place when you're speaking of national identity systems and, and, and how the, the architecture is, is set up? From what I'm getting, uh, gathering now is, is of course to, to improve the experience of the one who interacts with the system up front uh, before we, we, we get into the back office. 
Yeah, you know, good evening, Tom. Um, good evening, Minister. Um, you know, my main view on this is that uh, harness the current system is actually, unlike many of the other administrative systems we have in South Africa, it is a very well-designed um, system. It worked, it worked through a, it literally a decade of real difficulty, um, real trouble between 1995 and about 2006. Uh, but the live capture system is a remarkable system. The card works very well. There are some problems with the people um, selling access to the database. That, that clearly is a problem. Um, and the second other area, big problem, which I can't see an easy solution to, is is the network um, and keeping the network up in the context of, you know, uh, every four hours there's a major power failure. Every, you know, take, happening across the country, it's, it's very hard to, um, to picture. So if you were asking me where I worry about, I would say um, I'm worried that we might damage Harness. I think it works very well. It works, interacts well with the bank systems. Um, I'm sure the minister is aware and worried about what, you know, not, not losing what he's got. Um, so, so I would, I would say, um, yeah, let's, let's be careful. Um, let's focus on get, making the net network more robust, yeah. but also probably acknowledge that one of the things that's made Harness work so well is that the ruling party has had a really strong interest in including the number, increasing the numbers of people who have good credentials, um, mainly because those people vote uh, and they need an ID in order to vote. We don't, we don't require fingerprinting for, for at the at the voting station. We just require the ID, and that and that also works really well. Um, I'm a little worried about what Home Affairs' ambitions are um, for facial recognition, um, but my my real concerns are in fact. Uh, I, don't, I don't want to see uh, the harness system damaged. And one of the reasons for that is I know how difficult it was, it was to get it to work. You know, they literally fought um, very hard inside the department with the other departments, with justice, with social services, um, with, with transport, to, to try and get everybody to adopt the, the, the Home Affairs card, this, this very fancy ID card, smart card-based system we have, uh, and the departments all basically went their own way, built their own systems. And I think the cost of that is that we are constantly having to queue in order to get credentials. You know, you see queues in South Africa that are actually really not really necessary. Yeah. And my my big contrast, my last point on this, the big contrast really is with li driver's licensing, which is truly a nightmare uh, and should never have been allowed to basically develop their own independent system. But let me stop, I want to hear what you and your no, I, I, I hear you. Let, let, let's talk about that particular aspect of things that we have to queue for, for, for a large part of these things. Is there a way in which we could add more automated channels of access um, I, I don't know. I mean, there's a, 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 a situation that's envisaged, for example, in, in the white paper is that you could lose your, your document. You could be at home. Uh, at, that, at that point, you could be able to access a computer, get an affidavit from a police station, upload it uh, as proof of having lost that document, apply for a new one, uh, and immediately be able to be given some kind of a date of when you can go pick it up without you having ever left a home. Um, yeah, I mean, that it sounds, I think that's entirely sensible. And it's a, there are many countries that have done something like this, but they don't, they don't have the, the weights of biometrics that we do. We're, we're really distinctive. There are a few other countries. India is now one of them, which have really captured everybody biometrically. We've done that. Uh, I'm, I think biometrics are much more powerful than, than, than we really allow. It, it shouldn't be necessary to go to the police station and get an affidavit. Once the state have your biometrics, if your biometrics match what's in the database, they should issue you with the credentials. It's your credential. Um, you shouldn't need to go and persuade a policeman to sign. You know, I think every time we ask people to do another mm. transaction, we must ask ourselves who's paying for that. I mean, it's typically the citizens who do, who constantly is having to kind of get satisfy the, the demands of the bureaucracy for paper. Um, and it's often not necessary. So a fully online system should be fully online and it should really hinge on the value of the biometric data that the state holds. 
Let's talk about that then, Deputy Minister. I mean, the one question is the selling off of the, the database. Uh, how, how do you make the system? Harness is a great system. You've worked on it for decades. Uh, how do you protect the system that is currently clearly under threat from some kind of criminal syndicates that are wanting mm. to steal that information? And then, the, and then, two, how do you improve the automated channels mm. uh, so that people don't have to, in fact, queue at all? The queuing system would, would not necessarily be relevant anymore. You know, the, the, the tightrope that we are working is that of convenience and securing people's identity. You, you can't be overzealous with innovation whilst you do not back it up with necessary security. Yeah. And that is one of the principles that has made Hannes work for us very well. And we are taking that quite seriously. If you look in terms of data migration now, from Hannes to APIS, which is an automated biometric information system. And as much as Hannes has worked, we can't stick with it forever. We'll have to move on, uh, leverage on new technologies. Yeah. And why we take it seriously is that we had moved more than 99% of data to APIS. Only 113,000, about 113,000 uh, files, I will say, or people's identity uh, remain with not being moved to APIS. Other people will have said, well, 99%, that's a good margin of error, let us move. We, we said, no, you can't take a chance. We need to get this thing 100%. So as such, we are now moving the 113,000 records to make sure that we do not lose even a single person. So that is part of the security that we are investing in our, in our APIS project. I must also indicate that the APIS project is a cluster by cluster, I mean the JCPS yes. uh, cluster, which is the security class. It's a JCPS-funded project carried out by Home Affairs because it's going to be beneficial not just to Home Affairs but to other Justice Department, the police and so on. You will have had the minister indicating that even the police, they have access to our database so that they can verify certain people. If they need to, the yeah. banks have access to our database. So what we are doing is to improve and take it a notch higher while whilst making sure that it balances with the security interests of the country. A national population register is not something that you just play around with. It is the identity of the, card, yes. of the country. When yes, you are talking yes. about your identity as an identity number and your identity card, the national population register is like the identity of the country. It helps you plan economically to see where areas where people are, what kind of a dynamics exists within your population, and then it allows you yeah. to plan. And, and, and how, how does the current system then fit into the international migration systems? Because that's the next level. Well, in actual sense, our current systems, for instance, uh, if you look at the passport, how it is designed, it is a gateway to us interlinking with the global community. So the security that is attached with our, 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 with our systems is what gives credence to our passport to be accepted uh, globally. In terms of our immigration movement systems also, all of those that are fragmented, now we want to put them all together. For instance, with APIS, it allows the issue of e gates because when you capture biometrics and it's supported by the e-visa system, a person applies for the visa online, they get granted the visa, they then arrive in the country, they then get to be printed out a visa, their biometrics are then captured. When they come back as trusted travelers, they can then use our e gate system, which makes it easier now to move, which also plays a very important role in making sure that we facilitate trade. Yeah. The, third, uh, the third layer is that of asylum seekers, uh, which of course is a big issue in a big heading mm. uh, for, for South Africa, managing the asylum seekers and, and, and refugees in the context of that future fit model. How mm. does it fit? Well, we have a unique problem uh, in, in, in South Africa in the sense that most of the countries in Africa, when we deal with asylum seekers and refugees, they have what you call refugee camps. A person comes in through the uh, border, they say, I'm seeking asylum, they are then told to go into a refugee camp. With us, we have integrated asylum seekers in the country, which means they live amongst us and how we then need to put them into our own system, yet compartmentalize them as refugee seekers because they are not yet part of our uh, uh, national population reaches. And that is why we are introducing the NIS, which will then incorporate 
people who are coming in looking for work, people who are coming in visiting South Africa, all of them will be within, but not within the population register. Yeah. The, the NIS, that is the National Identity System, mm. uh, how, how does it work then differently to, to what you've already explained about the ABIS and how that captures the, the population mm. register? What it actually does is that it then captures all the people who come into the country. Whether you are a permanent resident, you are captured in terms of the NIS. Whether you are a naturalized person, you are captured in terms of the NIS. And then it then compartmentalizes those people into various sectors. What that allows us to do is to give us a single view of a person, not just only in terms of uh, South Africans, but also those who come in to visit. We are able to see, okay, here is Njabulu, he's captured, he's there in terms of APs, he's there in terms of Hanis, here is Njabulu moving. You can see him move, you can see him come back, we are able to develop trends on what he actually does, yeah. so that you can uh, improve on the level of service you offer. It also does the same with refugees, it also does the same with uh, PR holders who are able to look at them wholly, not just move from system to system on the basis of what we need to know. Yeah. Prof. Keith, how adaptable are these systems to international migration in terms of what you observe that is currently uh, being, being used elsewhere uh, in the world? Yeah, the technology can do, you know, exactly what the government policy requires from it. So it can be very inclusive and it can also be a very sharp cutting edge. Um, and we're seeing, you know, across the country more and more uh, pressure on the state to use the biometric credentials to kind of exclude people. So I don't think, the, I don't think this is really a matter of the technology. There are lots of people who worry that the technology itself is the is the tool, but in fact, in South Africa, harnesses by and large, mostly in it's, it's, in, it's incorporated. We don't have in South Africa the typical problem we have on the African continent, which is a, a group of people who, whose uh, citizenship is, is kind of philosophically contested by the state. There, and, and that would, you know, there many, most African countries have a large group of people who, who live on the border and cross the border and, and they're often considered um, you know, citizens of a different country. The classic example of this are the Somalians in Kenya. There have been Somalians in Kenya, whatever, but there are obviously lots of Somalians on the other side of the border. And the British, when they colonized Kenya, made a point of not resolving the question of where, whether the Somalians were citizens of Somaliland or, or, or Somalia or of um, Kenya. We haven't done that, and the ANC has incorporated lots of people uh, into the population register, and I think that's worked quite well. I think that the, it could continue to work along those lines. We could continue to be very actually inclusive of, of the migrants who come into, into the country, granting them status, granting them particularly visibility for disease, for disease monitoring, which is a really, really important problem. You don't want to start pushing people uh, into the underground, making them invisible. So, Tabo, I think the I think the mistake is to believe that it's the it's the tech facial recognition or biometrics that it, that leads to xenophobia. It's not that. It's it's a set of worked out policies actually that come that we that's what we need to be careful about. Yeah, the the, the three areas we've already touched on: current uh, national population register, uh, the civic register, the the varying systems under the Immigration Act, the, the systems of, of refugees. Have we done the legislative work that needs to be done there in, in, as far as the Home Affairs Act as well as the National Identity System Act? Yes, uh, we have actually uh, done the work. In fact, uh, South Africa as a country, you know, it's very way ahead of its uh, peers in terms of who are in the developing countries and in Africa in terms of identity and fighting the scandal of invisibility. I mean, if you look at institutions like ID for Africa that promote uh, having identity for people, they actually look up to South Africa on how we have managed uh, to get so many people to be formally uh, registered and be part of the national population register. We are having uh, some identif identity policies that we are pursuing. One of them was recently uh, adopted by cabinet, which 
which also deals with uh, the issue of intersex individuals, which is part of us opening up the scope so that you can have people who actually believe in self-identification and what we normally call, uh, you know, uh, gender X, where they, they can be marked as, as such if they want to be, so that we do not have a binary view on how we look at gender and how we look at sexual orientation. And those are all the progressive ways we are bringing inside to make sure that uh, those people actually are assisted and we treat everyone equally. So those policies are actually there. You will not be able to move. As the, as the prof was saying, the, the issue, technology is only an enabler of what you already want to do and what you have already set out in policy. If your policies are, are, are excluding people in nature, then obviously the systems that will be built on the basis of those policies will see exclusion of people. For instance, in South Africa, the first point of entry into a population register is through birth. Yes. And quite a number of uh, 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 foreign nationals, they give birth in South Africa. And you will know citizen in South Africa, you do not get it on the basis of you being born in South Africa. Our law says that you get it by being born through a South African parent, whether one of them or both of them, it doesn't matter. Then you get to be a South African citizen. But those who are not South African citizens born, born here, we make sure that in terms of policy, we issue them with what is called a notice of birth, so that the child does not have to suffer the scandal of invisibility. The notice of birth is then meant to be taken to the embassy of the parents, and then that embassy must then register that particular child. The only time we'll consider otherwise is when the child will be stateless. So we, we, we do not have a, a, a number of people who would claim that, look, I'm South African, I'm stateless, because of a policy that has made me stateless. It will rather be administrative issues yeah. that we always find a way to work around. And we pride ourselves for that. So we've touched on the future fit model. It sounds exciting. Let's talk about sustainable funding. I mean, the, 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 the one issue of course is uh, the question as, as to how, how are we going to pay for this so how are you going to charge people uh, for this in terms of the, the various uh, uh, services that they are going to, mm. to, to, to be accessing what are the fees what's, what's the structure of that? Okay. Particularly for the APIS project, the funding has already been allocated. It's what we are spending off against. We have to spend on physical hardware. We are now in completion of, or completion of, phase, two, of phase one. That we spend within the budget that we have. We are not actually taking away from citizens. The time that we were actually using what we call self-financing. Because you know when a person applies for a passport, there is a fee that is charged, which is also amongst the cheapest in the world when you look at it. We only just recently now adjusted our fees, but even there it's not quite substantial. If you look at when you get your ID for the first time, when you turn 16 years, you get your smart ID card for free. So we do not charge you. So there is not much of a pattern that rests with our citizens because we are able to manage those things. Part of the of managing is to take those self-financing activities. That's what we call them. When people pay us, we have to go and pay JPW to produce the product, whatever is remaining there. We look what kind of advances we can make. For instance, our hospital rollout program, right. where we register beds in, 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 in hospitals and opening up offices in hospital. It has been purely funded mainly with our self-financing activities, which means we take the money that we receive and actually use it there. Take us to the roadmap uh, where we are in terms of implementation. Now we are still on, on phase one, which means you have taken in about 2,000 uh, uh, graduates that mm -hmm. are coming in to, to, to assist with the digitization uh, process. Let's talk about the politics. You're, they say you're not paying them enough. So <laughs> you've got diploma people being paid 5,000. I think the degree ones, a little bit of 14,000 honors, it, it goes up and, and so on and so forth. So they're saying it, it's not enough. The disgrace is how much you're paying them. Well, it's always the issue of uh, contested payments uh, and salaries. It's always a contested issue in South Africa. We are amongst the best paying internships in the country. If you look at the student uh, assistant project that was paying around 2.5, we've chopped that up. And there's going to be uh, various grades in which people are going to be paid on the basis of experience. And as much as this is not a permanent employment, it is rather giving ease 
an opportunity to young people to be in the market, gain the experience, and some of them are still going to be using in the long run. So we understand that uh, it might not be the full complement of a salary of a person that is full-time employed with benefit. It put us more on a line of being like an internship as well as just a, a relief for those young people who are unemployed. Yeah. Have you onboarded them all at this point and they're ready to go? I think is it 1st of December yeah. that they're supposed to kick off? We are introducing it in phases. Uh, we started recruiting the 2000. That process has closed. We are now in the selection process. We are now going to advertise for the other trans, which is the 4,000. The 4,000, we anticipate them to then start by December, and then the other trans, which is the last trans, somewhere around April next year. Fantastic. Deputy Minister, thank you very much for coming on thank and you. clearing some of those issues for us. Deputy Minister of Home Affairs, Jablon Zuza, as well as... Uh, Professor Keith Breckenridge, Deputy Director of the Verts Institute for Social and Economic Research.